start recording yeah so hello everyone and welcome to another icts virtual string seminar we are happy to have subranil chakravarti from imsc with us today and he is going to talk to us about uh, pure spinner super strings massive states okay over to you subranil uh thank you um and also thanks to the organizers for this kind invitation and also organizing uh, this wonderful seminar series virtually over the past few months so the title of my talk today is pure spinner super strings massive states and these uh, talk uh, it will be broadly two parts one will be review of pure spinner super strings and one will be based on these three papers that i wrote with uh, sitender and mitunjay so the central role in this talk will be played by string scattering amplitudes so you can ask very well that why should we study string asymmetrics so if you're like me and you really take string theory seriously then the answer is very simple it is basically uh, one of the fundamental observables of perturbative string theory just like in perturbative qft we want to compute uh, the asymmetrics uh, simply for in perturbative string theory we should try to compute the string asymmetrics and study it but perhaps you are uh, of a more esoteric nature and you want to uh, probe beyond perturbative string theory then even for non perturbative aspects of string theory such as s duality which uh, is a conjectured duality in string theory uh starting string asymmetrics actually gives non trivial evidence for s duality um this is some incomplete sampling of a long list of people who have been working on this and in fact just today morning there has been a paper uh, by these uh, four authors uh, probing uh, this exact questions in this direction and even if you don't take string theory seriously you should still want to study string asymmetrics for the simple reason that right now this is the only framework in quantum theory which includes both matter as well as gravity and it gives you an uv finite answer so this is the only thing that we know um, so far in theoretical physics which can deal with a quantum theory of matter and gravitation and gives me an uv finite answer so i hope uh, this uh, gives a very strong reason to study uh, string asymmetrics uh, at least take it very seriously and study it um, so that's the essential uh, goal so the historically we have always uh, studied string theory traditionally in two aspects or two approaches so one is called rns named after ramond nevu and schwartz after the discoverer of it so this formulation can be uh, without any exaggeration called the formulation of super strings chances are if you have studied super string theory at all you have actually studied this formulation it works with a wall sheet supersymmetric theory and it's it's a maintains manifest poincare covariance and wall sheet supersymmetry and it has a very elegant construction of vertex operators uh, based on super conformal field theory of the wall sheet and it has a very clear and uh, very clean amplitude prescription um it has mostly been hugely successful over the last 3 uh, decades of string theory and uh, there are a very few points in which one can actually do a critique of rns and those two points i have mentioned here one is that the space time supersymmetry is not manifest you have to do something called a gso projection to get a space time supersymmetric spectrum and typically if you want to compute two loops and higher amplitudes using rns formulation you run into some technical challenges these are not conceptual challenges but these are technical challenges uh, some of them are summing over the spin structures and involve something called picture changing operators on the other hand there is has also been an approach in string theory not as popular as rns but uh, advocated by green and schwartz and these maintains manifest space time supersymmetry unlike rns but the downside is that it can be only quantized in light cone gauges and therefore it is not at all helpful compute, computing amplitudes um however it does not require any pc or summing over spin structures but since it can only be quantized in light cone gauges its amplitudes are not manifestly poincare covariant and the answer looks very ugly and uh, one can ask that could there be a wall sheet formulation of super string theory which has the best of the both world it maintains manifest poincare covariance like the rns it maintains the manifest space time supersymmetry like the green schwartz and as a result hopefully the amplitude prescriptions will not run into this troubles uh, i should also mention that uh, this trouble in rns that i mentioned has to do indirectly or directly with the fact that there is no manifest space time supersymmetry in our rns so 
such such an approach is actually pure spinner formulation as uh, i will uh, describe and uh, elaborate in this talk so the rough plan of the talk is uh, divided into two parts the first part is essentially a review of pure spinner formulation and uh, i will also give you a rundown of the huge success that pure spinner formulation has enjoyed over the last two decades when external massless states are uh, used and the second part will be dealing with our work. I will tell you about how we gave a COVID in prescription to construct massive vertex operators in pure spinner. And we will see the prescription in action and we will establish explicit equivalence between amplitudes computed using RNS and pure spinner with external massive states. And we will conclude with some uh, future directions. Okay, so let's start with uh, pure spinner formulation. For the time being, just ignore this word minimal. I will uh, qualify this adjective uh, in a few short slides. So the pure spinner formulation uh, right off the gate starts with a wall sheet CFT and the wall sheet action looks like this. I should also mention that for specificity in this talk, we will only be talking about open strings, uh, but it does not mean that pure spinner formulation only works for open strings. It works for both for open and closed strings, but just for uh, being specific in this talk, I will stick to every action, everything will, we will stick to the open string cases. So the action uh, looks like this. So action has a usual, uh, the matter sector, which is the bosonic space-time coordinates, X. It has a space-time fermionic coordinates. So the, our space-time actually now is extended to a super space. And P alpha is its conjugate momentum of this theta. And there is a host sector expressed by a host lambda alpha. This lambda alpha is a Majorana wild spinet and W alpha is its conjugate momentum. Now you can ask that where did this action come from? And right now, all we will say is that there is some underlying wall sheet gates theory, which on gates fixing gives this, but we will not ask where is that wall sheet gates theory and how we can get to, get to this. I will say a brief uh, few lines uh, down the line. So this, this lambda alpha plays the role of the coast. So it's a commuting Majorana wild spinet and it actually satisfies a constraint which is to be imposed at all levels, including the action, which is lambda gamma m lambda equals to zero. And this constraint is actually something that was introduced uh, by the mathematician Ile Kotha long ago, and it's known as a pure spinner constraint. And there ergo the name of the formalism, uh, the pure spinner formalism. Now, written like this, this action does not look space-time supersymmetric, but this, first two terms is actually something that you also encounter if you write the green Schwartz action in the first order formulation. So you can actually make the space-time supersymmetry manifest by playing the same game that green Schwartz did. So they introduced two variables, capital Pi and capital D, instead of the variables del X and small p. So capital P is defined like this, capital Pi is defined like this, capital small d is defined like this. And the point is that if I replace del xm by p pi m and uh, uh, p alpha by small d alpha, then this action will take exactly a supersymmetric form. And the point is that this capital pi and small d are manifestly space-time supersymmetric. So one thing that I should also mention is that um, this form of the action, while it does not look manifestly space-time supersymmetric, it's nonetheless much simple because it's just a free action. However, if we want to work with this variables which maintains manifest space-time supersymmetry, you see because this contains combinations of x and thetas, the action will no longer, or these objects will no longer enjoy free field OPs. So this is, there is a trade-off. So if you work with manifestly space-time supersymmetric variables, then there is a trade-off that our OPs will no longer be free field OPs. So it's just a technical um, uh, a difficulty that we will have to encounter uh, and uh, hold with, but it's, it's nothing insurmountable. So along with the matter sector, the, the ghost sector actually enjoys a gates invariance because of the pure spinner constraint. Because this lambda, comma m lambda equals to zero, you can take a derivative and from here you can actually derive that, uh, so if I may write, del lambda gamma m lambda is also equals to zero. And because this is equals to zero, you can actually show that W alpha, if it changes by some uh, combination like this, 
then you can show that uh, this action actually remains invariant. And as a result, there is a gauge invariance due to pure spinner constraint. So the way to deal with this gauge invariance is to work with gauge invariant combinations as is usual in any field theory. And the two important gauge invariant combinations for this purpose are this NMN, which is an anti-symmetric uh, uh, current, and this J, uh, which is a scalar. And this has the uh, interpretation as the Lorentz ghost current, and this has the interpretation as the ghost number current. So one good thing about pure spinner formulation is that the BRST operator takes a remarkably simple form. So this BRST operator, of course, if we knew what is the underlying Walsh-Shade gauge theory, we could derive it, but I have not told you what is the underlying Walsh-Shade gauge theory. I just gave you some gauge fixed form. So uh, take my word for it. And this BRST operator takes remarkably simple form that Q equals to dz lambda alpha d alpha. And the nil potency of this BRST operator actually also follows from uh, the pure spinner constraint because you can show that this operator d alpha d beta satisfies an OP which looks like this. So when you take Q square, it actually is proportional to lambda gamma m lambda Shubhrani, I am not able to see anything you're writing. At least I'm not able to see. Oh, I see. Um, is, 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 is it with uh, everyone? Yeah, I think. Yes, we are not able to see the writing. We are just seeing the cursor, a red dot. Ah, I see, I see. Um, so. Okay, I don't know why the annotate thing, it, it's, it's, it shows up in my screen. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, seems to be the problem. Okay, um, so, so let me just, uh, let me just uh, say it in words then. So if I take Q squared, so this, you, what you will have is this lambda alpha d alpha, you will have another lambda beta d beta say, and these lambdas don't have any OPs among themselves, but these Ds do. And this d alpha d beta OP actually gives you another gamma matrix. It's a gamma m alpha beta and there is a capital pi m. Because there is a gamma matrix and there are two lambdas sitting there. So you have actually lambda alpha gamma m, lambda beta, and that actually is the pure spinner constraint. And so Q square is zero identically due to the pure spinner constraint. So if the point is that if lambda is a pure spinner, then this uh, operator is nil potent by uh, definition. So as, as I said that one of the price that we pay the working with manifestly space time supersymmetric objects in matter sector and manifestly gauge invariant operators in the ghost sector is that we no longer, these objects no longer satisfy free field OPEs. And as a result, what happens is that all of these objects, the odd normal ordering satisfies this, uh, this uh, non-associative normal ordering that we are uh, familiar from our old CFT courses. So it means that we have to be careful about the operator ordering and it serves us well if we choose and fix an operator ordering in all composite operators uh, down the line. And the ordering that we choose is this, that in any composite operators, our matter sectors will always sit on the leftmost and the ghost current sectors will then sit next and ghost operators, if it is there, it will sit on the rightmost. And within the matter and the ghost, the relative orderings are given like this. So within the matter, spies will come on the leftmost, then B, then del theta. In the ghost current sector, N will come on the left and J will come on the right. And lambda, of course, is the only ghost operator, so it will sit on the right. So this is what this ordering means. So, so you don't need to worry about this ordering because every expression in this slide will always be given in this ordering. But uh, I just wanted you to be aware of this uh, subtlety. Okay, so now to sort of quant qualify that why is this word minimal there. So the way I described this pure spinner formulation was proposed by Nathan Barkovitz uh, roughly around 99, 2000. And it enjoyed a lot of success, but soon it became apparent that there are two uh, shortcomings. One is that one could not construct a covariant B ghost. And actually you need a covariant B ghost if you want to go and go ahead and compute loop amplitudes and so on and so forth. 
Another thing was that loop amplitude prescription actually required some picture changing operators and this picture changing operators actually it so happened that it breaks manifest Poincare covariance at an intermediate step. And this breaking is actually very trivial. You can show that this, this term which breaks the manifest Poincare covariance is always BRST exact. So it will actually not affect any of the physical result. But if we are really advocating a formalism which boasts that it combines the Poincare covariance and space time supersymmetry together, then this does not seem very aesthetically pleasing. So both of these shortcomings were actually remedied by extending the host sector to include additional host variables. So instead of just one PO spinner host lambda, we will introduce some other host sector thing. And this new formulation was called non-minimal PO spinner formalism. And as a result, the old one is uh, given an adjective, minimal PO spinner. Uh, is there a question? Okay. So what is non-minimal PO spinner formulation? The non-minimal is whatever action, wall sheet action you had for the minimal case. So your matter sector is completely untouched. It's completely unchanged. The PO spinner host that I introduced earlier is also completely unchanged. You introduce some new host objects, this W bars and lambda bars. Uh, sorry, th these bars don't confuse with uh, anti-holomorphic or anything. This, this bar on uh, the field variables are really denoting different field. Um, not to confuse with this bar on the del. So I'm, I apologize for this unfortunate notation. So this lambda bar is another pure spinner ghost, but it's a, it, it has the opposite chirality than the original lambda one. The original lambda has an alpha on the upstairs. This one has a lambda alpha on the downstairs. And there is another fermionic ghost, R. It is also constrained and it satisfies the constraints lambda bar gamma m R equals to zero. And this W bars and S are the conjugate momenta to these two new ghosts. And with this modification, the BRST charge actually also receives some modification. It's the old BRST charge, plus now there is a new term, W bar alpha, R alpha. And I should also say that this new non-minimal variables actually do not talk to the minimal sector at all. So they do not have any non-trivial OP with the lambda host. So this lambda bars, W bars, uh, this R is, they don't have any non-trivial OP with the lambda sector. Now you may well ask that, okay, fine, this is, seems like a very uh, simple extension. What did we get out of this? What we do get out of this is that first is that you can actually prove that even with this new BRSC charge, the cohomology of the new BRSC charge and the cohomology of the old BRSC charge are absolutely identical, which means that you can construct the vertex operator for the minimal PO spinner and they will still continue to belong to the cohomology of this non-minimal PO spin. So the first point is simply saying to construct vertex operator or the spectrum, it's enough to work with the minimal variables. The non-minimal variables do not play any role in com computing the spectrum. The second point is that you can actually with this new variables, whatever wall sheet theory that, you, that I wrote down in this previous slide, you can actually interpret this as a critical topological string theory more specifically, this is called an N equals to two C hat equals to three topological string theory. It has been studied for other reasons in the literature. And this string theory is actually a bosonic string theory. And what Barkovitz proposed is that he said that the amplitude prescription for the non-minimal pure spinner therefore can be simply taken to be the amplitude prescription for this bosonic string theory. And this bosonic being, being a bosonic string theory, this amplitude prescription does not require any picture changing operator. It does not require any summing over spin structures. And this is precisely what we were trying to uh, get at because I, as I described in RNS, these two issues were one of the stumbling block in computing higher genus uh, amplitudes. So this amplitude prescription is actually what gives pure spinner such power in computing higher genus uh, amplitudes compared to RNS formulation. Additionally, it also allows covariant construction of B host, which you remember in the minimal pure spinner, I said that you cannot construct a covariant B host, but here you can construct a B host completely covariantly. This was done by uh, first attempted by Oswaldo Chandia. There were some uh, shortcomings there, which was uh, completely remedied by a construction by Renan Jusinska. And the good thing is that for 20 years, one of the main criticism of PO spinner formulation was that this wall sheet CFT seems very ad hoc. This action I just simply wrote down. And for a long time, people did not know what kind of underlying wall sheet gauge theory could be gauge fixed to get this answer. For example, in the bosonic string theory, you know that there is a Polyakov action, which on gauge fixing reduces to this usual matter plus BC CFT. So if instead of giving the Polyakov gauge 
theory, I give you directly this matter plus BCCFT, you could very well ask that where did this uh, thing come from? Where on, on gauge fixing, which gauge theory did we get this action? That answer was uh, for a long time not known in pure spinner formulation. But last year, Renan Justinskas actually showed that there is an underlying wall shape gauge theory, which on gauge fixing gives you this non-minimal pure spinner thing. So if, even if you, if it, if it is too much, just remember this, that non-minimal PO spinner actually gives you the powerful amplitude prescription, which actually gives PO spinner formulation the edge over the RNS formulation, precisely this two point. And on the other hand, while constructing vertex operators and as such, the non-minimal variables plays no role at all because the cohomologies are exactly identical. And therefore the minimal PO spinner, whatever the vertex operators you construct there will continue to be a good vertex operator and non-minimal minimal PO spinner as well. Okay, so how does vertex operators in pure spinner formulation looks? Uh, hello. So, yeah, hi. Sir, so Shubhanit, uh, you know, just to understand this statement that uh, this, um, this theory is actually a topological string theory. Uh -huh. um, I'm just uh, slightly confused by this statement because we usually expect topological string theory to be able to, comp you know, is capable of computing only a subset of uh, things, right? You know, like it's not, it's not a full string theory. It computes some protected quantities and so on and so forth. Um, right. uh, that's one way of thinking about topological string theory. So, um, how is this consistent with the statement that uh, this theory we are going to, or we want to use it to compute everything, right? You know, like any. Yeah, I, I yeah I understand the question. So so what what this means exactly is that. So let me go back this slide. So this. BRST charge, for example, so if, if it is really a topological string theory, so this BRST charge somehow should appear in the topological string theory as well, right? In topological string theory, this is actually one of the fermionic currents. So it does not have an interpretation as a BRST charge. So what, what we mean here that it can be interpreted as a critical topological string theory is that all the variables have a one-to-one -one correspondence However, in non-minimal PO spinner, there is an additional input that we are giving, which is we are taking one of the fermionic currents in the topological string theory, and we are saying that this, we declared it to be our BRST operator or BRST current. And with respect to that BRST current, we are going to construct all vertex operators and uh, as such, and all the amplitudes that we are going to uh, talk about, or the composite B goes that we are going to uh, sort of talk about, all of them will be defined with respect to this BRST operator. So this in, in this in input is an additional thing which is not there in the topological string, and it is this information which actually gives non-minimal pure spinner the additional information, which uh, the topological string doesn't have. So if you of course if you remove this uh, interpretation like this, if you if you just refuse to call this as a BRST operator and you just uh, call it a fermionic current, and then you whatever you get out of that, it will be just the topological sector. It won't be the full string theory. Okay, so if, if I can understand uh, what you're saying, it seems to me that you know like, you are kind of trying to get the all the observables of string theory as a subset of observables in a topological string theory uh, by passing on to some cohomology of what you um, use. In, 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 I mean, um, in, 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 some, in some sense, I mean, in topological string theory, the cohomology of this particular operator is actually of no interest one does not look into the cohomology of this operator at all. I mean, there is a dif different BRST operator defined there. So, 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 so is that what happens that, you know, like uh, uh, that you kind of stop going to the cohomology of that BRST? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So, 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 you, so, so you start with the topological string theory um, with, uh, you know, like uh, some BR, some notion of BRST charge and so on, but somehow like shift what you are calling it as BRST charge, mm -hmm. and puts the topological string theory into non-topological string. Is that a good way of saying what? Yeah, in, yeah. Instead of shifting, you are saying that I mean, instead of looking into cohomology of this operator, we are saying that there is another uh, nilpotent operator, and we are going to be interested in cohomology of that, and that actually changes the interpretation radically. Okay, so the same theory, but with different choice of a BRST operator, either is either topological or non-topological. Yeah, in, yeah, in some sense, that is uh, what is happening. I mean, right now we have a much better understanding because we have actually underpinned what is the underlying wall sheet gauge theory. So you can actually derive this. 
and in fact in fact you can show that this particular form of the action is one cons one type of gauge fixing gives you this there are other equivalent gauge fixing which will give you other uh, e equally good uh, answers so so one one good way would be to derive this amplitude prescription without relying on this interpretation as a topological string theory at all that is something that is still lacking right now but uh, hopefully it can be done uh, in the near future so um, just one more question and then sure sure so like is this something that we should have expected uh, a priori is there some way to say that this is what we should have expected that there should be some topological string theory which we can um, use to define the worship theory or is this a complete uh, surprise in the mysterious thing I mean, I, I, I think it's a complete surprise. I don't think there was any indication, at least not to me uh, whatsoever, that uh, such an interpretation uh, seemed very likely. And, and, it, and even since. So, so I mean, I mean, I mean uh, in, in some sense, uh, prior to this derivation, this whole thing seemed a, a bit magical. That why, why is it working? Why is it giving the correct answers of string theory and so on and so forth? So right now we have, of course, an underlying Walshit gauge theory, which is a very important step, but there are still much left to be understood in that direction. But I agree. I mean, this is not something that you uh, would intuitively expect uh, that a topological string theory, if you just uh, sort of look into a different cohomology, it's supposed to contain the full super strings. Okay. Thanks. Can I ask a question as well? Yeah, please go ahead. So uh, the amplitude prescription requires no PCOs and some of the spin structures. So I'm wondering oh. if there is an underlying super Riemann surface, first of all. And if yes, what about what happened to the odd moduli? Right. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, in, this, in the sense that you don't have a super Riemann surface because you're starting off with a wall sheet CFT, not a super conformal field theory. So you're, you actually have to just do a sum over Riemann surfaces and the, the moduli integration over the moduli space of those Riemann surfaces. Um, that that is uh, still left. Um, the the reason is that if you remember, um, this summing over spin structure imposes this GSO uh, projection, right? So it gives you the space-time supersymmetric thing. We are starting already with a manifestly space-time supersymmetric theory, so we don't need to uh, have an underlying super uh, Riemann surface kind of structure to uh, to do this. So in some sense, we already have uh, inherently done that. So, so in some sense, probably a better way to understand would be to sort of understand that how this underlying wall sheet gauge theory is related to the RNS formalism, for example. So there has been some work, Bakovitz himself has uh, done some work, but I think that there are uh, much, much, the clear establishment of this two uh, is something that is not very clear. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any, any other question? Okay, if not, let me proceed. Okay, so how does vertex operators look in pure spinner formulation? So all, all unintegrated vertex operators actually will take the form, which schematically we can write as some operator OI and some superfield SI. And these operators will be combined, uh, sort of constructed out of these objects that I've already introduced, pi d del theta, n j and lambda, and uh, for nth massive state, the unintegrated vertex V must have conformal weight N and the ghost number one. So if you're confused about why this is conformal weight N, it's because I will always implicitly assume that this V is to be multiplied by a plane wave factor e to the power IK dot X, whose conformal weight will of course will add to this and make the whole thing the correct conformal weight. But this plane wave factor, I'm always going to sort of forget about it. So that's why whatever is remaining after without the plane wave factor, if you do the counting correctly, you will see that it must have conformal weight in and host number one. Now, among all these objects, all these objects have conformal weight one. And of course, you can in keep on increasing conformal weights of these objects by taking wall sheet derivatives or multiplying them together. But all of them also have host number zero. On the other hand, this host variable, pure spinner host lambda, it has conformal weight zero, but it has host number one. So it's a very nice clean separation of conformal weight and host number. So whatever massive states vertex operator you are trying to construct, the rule is that you basically write down all such possible terms. So for example, we will soon see an example for the massless state, uh, how to construct the vertex operator. And then you will have some index hanging around on this O because if you take a bunch of these and sort of put them side by side, 
you will have some bunch of Lorentz indices and Spinner indices uncontracted. And the, your superfield should have appropriate index structure such that the whole thing is a Lorentz scalar. So that's what I mean by appropriate superfield. So it schematically looks like this. So if it, if, it, if it is really a vertex operator, then you know that it must belong to the cohomology, which means that when I act on it by the BRSC operator, it must be identically zero. So if I act on the BRSC operator by these two objects, I will get two kinds of term. One is when the BRSC operator acts on this operator combinations O, and one is when the BRSC operator acts on the superfield itself. So this QO we can sort of think of as some new operators, O tilde, say, and this QS we can think of as a new superfield, uh, some S tilde, and we can repackage this whole thing into some another schematic sum, OI tilde, SI tilde equals to zero. And ideally what we would like to do is that since QV has to be zero and this sum has to be zero, and these operators are wall sheet variables, you would naively assume that, okay, fine, this means that whatever this new SI tildes are, this combination of SIs and QSIs, they have to be zero for each I. But that actually is not quite correct. Because of pure spinner constraint, we will soon see that this OI tildes are not all going to be actually linearly independent. So one actually needs to take care of the subtlety at each level. So this, this may seem a bit abstract. So let's see this with a concrete example for the massless unintegrated vertex. So for the massless unintegrated vertex, the n is zero. So the vertex must be of conformal weight zero and ghost number one. And there is only such one possibility. You can have only one or wall sheet uh, operator which has conformal weight zero and ghost number one and that is lambda itself. And because lambda has one spinner index hanging around, you need to multiply it with a suitable superfield which precisely contracts this thing. And we are con calling this arbitrary superfield, some capital A alpha. So the BRSC condition QV equals to zero simply means that remember Q is this contour integral lambda times D. So there is lambda beta, D beta, and then it acts on this. This D does not talk to the lambda, D directly hits the superfield. And this is one result from the OP, which you can easily derive that whenever this D hits a superfield, it could be any superfield. I'm suppressing the indices of the superfield capital F. It just gives a super covariant derivative of that with a simple pole. Now, what that means is that this QV equals to zero simply reduces to this expression, lambda beta, lambda alpha, D beta A alpha equals to zero. Now, at this point, you might be tempted to say that, okay, fine, see, lambda beta, lambda alpha, these are after all my wall sheet goes, they cannot be zero. So perhaps it means that D beta A alpha should be zero. But remember that lambda beta, lambda alpha are not really independent. They are set constrained by this pure spinner constraint. So if I do this by spinner decomposition, I will generate three kinds of term. One will be with a single gamma matrix, one will be gamma three form, and one will have a gamma five form. Now the gamma one form will vanish because of the pure spinner constraint. We said that this lambda is a pure spinner, so lambda gamma m lambda must vanish. The three form thing will vanish because lambdas are bosonic and uh, this gamma is actually turns out to be anti-symmetric in the spinner indices. As a matrix, these are anti-symmetric. So these are identically zero as well. So the only thing that actually is independent from this by spinner decomposition is this five form combination. So whenever we have this lambda beta lambda alpha, to actually sort of extract out the independent piece due to this pure spinner constraint, as well as the fact that lambdas are bosonic variables because these are ghosts, we should decompose it like this and substitute it back. And when we do that, the equation reduces to this. Now we can argue that this lambda gamma MNPQ or lambda is not zero because it is really the independent piece of this, uh, this pure spinner variable. So we can easily forget about this. It's the rest of the term which should be zero. So this has to be zero, but this precisely is the linearized equation of motion of d equals to 10 n equals to one super young mills. And this form of the super young mills equation in super space was actually known from since the early eighties due to work by Warren Siegel and Edward Witten. And uh, this is precisely what you would expect for the massless states of an open super string. You would expect that the unintegrated vertex operator should, uh, the BRC condition for that should really reproduce the linearized super young mills equation. And of course, once you identify that this A alpha is nothing but the super field denoting the super, uh, massless super multiplet of the super young mill, you know what is the complete theta expansion of this in terms of gluons and gluinos. So that determines the unintegrated vertex for the massless states. 
So what about the integrated vertex? We all know that if you want to compute amplitudes, you should not stop at just at constructing unintegrated vertex. You also need the integrated vertex. And typically one defines integrated vertex by an insertion of BHOS to the unintegrated vertex and then integrating over it. But BHOS is not a natural object in pure spinner formalism because BHOS, remember, it comes from gauge fixing the diffu diffu Volsche diffeomorphism invariance of an underlying Polyakov or RNS like action. Uh, we never told you what is the underlying gauge theory. So this B host, while there is uh, something that you can construct as a B host, it's not really a natural object. It's a composite operator that you construct out of other things. So what we would really like is that we would like to take this definition and massage it to a definition which does not involve this B host. And that is actually easily done if you act on the BRST charge by both sides and you use the fact that QB is essentially the stress tensor, you can actually rewrite this same equation as QU equals to del V. So this is something, this QU equals to del V is what we will take in pure spinner as our defining condition for the integrated vertex. That given an unintegrated vertex V, an integrated vertex is U such that QU equals to del V. So once again, if V has a form of uh, operators times superfield sum, you can clearly discern from this equation that an unintegrated vertex should also have such a structure. But now the conformal weight should be n plus one and the ghost number should be zero. Because remember that Q contains a lambda, it contains a ghost. So whatever ghost B has, V has, Q already took care of it. So you cannot contain any ghost number. And whatever this extra operator, uh, this de derivative, whatever extra conformal weight it brings in. So that uh, has to be taken care of as well. So let us look in. Sorry, can I ask one more thing? Uh, yeah, sure. This expression in the previous slide, yeah. This expression for you, this is an ordinary sort of RNS formulation. This is only valid locally. Uh, That's so, true, yeah. So, uh, the, so you said that you're gonna massage it into a form that is covariant. Will that now be valid globally? So will it be globally well-defined on the world sheet? Yeah, what, what, yeah. what I meant is that this relation QE equals to del V is equally valid in RNS as well. It, it, it simply follows from the fact that Q acting on B is, uh, that the fact that V is BRS invariant and QB is basically the stress tensor. Yes, but this is only valid locally, right? In one chart. Yeah, so, so that's, that's fine. Uh, but the point is, that's, so, so as long as you, uh, you're worried about the contributions from the boundaries, right? So I'm, worry, I'm worrying about the, the, the global constraints, like, um, you know, there's this vertical integration that Ashok had to yeah, introduce yeah, yeah. in order so, to work with holomorphic charts locally. Yeah. So, so um, what we are what we are yeah. saying is that in pure spinner, so so this is this is a basically a loose way to inspire this descent relation. So in pure spinner, we are never going to invoke this relationship at all. In pure spinner, we are going to say that even globally, the definition of the integrated vertex is going to give, give be given by this descent equation. And it's one way to motivate that if instead of just simply writing down this, one way to motivate this is that uh, is to argue that in RNS also locally, you can uh, argue that this kind of relationship is valid. So it's not something that really is falling from the sky. But in pure spinner, we are never going to sort of argue that this actually is, comes from something else. We're just going to postulate that our definition of integrated vertex is such that this relationship holds globally. Okay, I need to think about it a bit more, yeah. but thanks. Can okay. I just make a comment? I think that maybe what uh, Dimitri was worried about is that if, if these things are not primaries, then how to make a different coordinate system, then the two sides will transform differently. But in your case, I think you will have both as primaries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you will yeah. be dimension right. zero primary, Q, U is a ah, dimension ah, one primary. Ah, right, right, right. So, so you're only interested in primaries. Okay, okay, yes, then, then that's fine. That's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so just like the integrated case, also let us see the massless uh, integrated vertex in action. So it has to be, because it's a massless, it has to be conformal with zero plus one, so one and ghost number zero object. And the most general such operator that you can write down is this. So you can have either del theta as your operator, then you have to have a superfield which correspondingly suitably contracts and similarly pi m and uh, d alpha c alpha and so on and so forth. Now. What, what basically means to say that we are going to construct U. Constructing U essentially means that we have to determine all these hatted superfields 
which are now arbitrary in terms of this unintegrated the superfield that appeared in the unintegrated vertex which satisfied the super young mills equation this capital a alpha that i called so we have to determine all these unknown superfields in terms of that such that they identically satisfy this equation q u equals to del b so this is what it means to construct the integrated vertex so once you have constructed the unintegrated vertex to construct the integrated vertex means that you first write down an answers like this and all these unknown superfields needs to be re-expressed in terms of the superfield that already appears in the unintegrated vertex such that this q u equals to del v equation is identically satisfied so this uh, i'm not uh, writing down the full solution because of time but this has already been solved a uh, long time back and essentially one knows both the unintegrated and integrated vertex for the massless states and you also know the covariant theta expansion for them to all orders in terms of the physical fields the gluons and the gluinos so what 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 did people did do after this uh, obtaining this massless states so of course this is the only manifestly super poincare covariant wall sheet theory of super strings and then it has since then been tremendously successful in computing scattering amplitudes of massless string states and in fact in some cases it surpasses the well known rns formalism approach in fact precisely at genus 2 and uh, if one can push beyond that it will typically surpass the computational difficulty or the tediousness of the computational difficult uh, computation in the rns approach and in fact the only so far only known three loop computation uh, in in certain limit has been done using pure spinner this was done by uh, umberto gomez and carlos mafra and there has been a lot of people who have worked on this for over the years uh, and and uh, the, the success for pure spinner for external massless states has been really a huge huge thing but despite all that success the massive states remain comparatively unexplored and this is actually a bit uh, troublesome because if you are really saying that you have given a new formalism for uh, doing super string theory and remember super strings has only one massless states but then they have an infinite tower of massive states so we better know how to handle the massive states as well so the unintegrated vertex was actually constructed by berkowitz and chand in this paper and we will briefly review it uh, and then ddf like construction was given by josin skas uh, but once again because it's ddf like construction it's in light cone coordinates and once again it's not manifestly poincare covariant so it's again against the spirit of pure spinner that it should be a super poincare covariant formulation so there has been some general arguments which were uh, established the equivalence between pure spinner and rns or green shoes formulation which was due to barkovitz and barkovitz mafra uh, but the explicit equivalence prior to our work was only known for external massless states so if you have amplitudes same amplitudes computed using pure spinner and rns but all external states are massless people had already demonstrated that they all match for tree level for loop levels for uh, whatever amplitudes that you can compute using both formulation uh, but for external massive states this was uh, lacking so far so this is where part 1 ends so if there is any question for part 1 i will take here otherwise i will move on to the massive states okay so if not so the first massive states in open super strings actually contains these three uh, physical fields two of them are bosonics this is a three form field bmnp contains 84 degrees of freedom it's a symmetric tensor gmn contains 44 degrees of freedom and there is a spin 3 half tensor spinner it contains 128 degrees of freedom and you can see that 84 plus 44 is indeed 128 and this physical field satisfy this transversality and uh, traceless conditions and barkovitz and chandia actually constructed the unintegrated vertex which uh, represents this particular massive uh, supermultiple so what what do we mean by they constructed this uh, vertex it means that all these unknown superfields that appears in this unintegrated vertex they actually express in terms of physical onshell superfield let's call it bmnp and its super covariant derivative so how does uh, that work so once again you first write down the most general conformal weight one host number one object and with some arbitrary superfields and you remember that all vertex operators has an additional gauge conditions because these has to be brs invariant if i shift this vertex operator by a brs exact term then this uh, does not change the physics so that actually allows us to gauge fix or do some field redefinition for the superfields even prior to solving them and uh, barkovitz and chandia used this conditions 
to exhaust all possible gauge freedoms here. And remember, because of PO spinner constraints, all these operators will not be completely independent. Precisely, N contains already a lambda inside it. So does J. And there is an external lambda sitting there. So it means that they are actually going to be related by something. And this is the relation that you can uh, easily derive from pure spinner and a few lines of algebra. And the way to, way to make these uh, operators independent, uh, Barkovitz and Chandra introduce a Lagrange multiplier superfield. This is not a physical superfield, but what it does is that if you identically add this zero term to this QV equation, then you can actually then subsequently treat all these uh, uh, operator combinations as linearly independent. So with all this done, the QV equals to zero, QV plus Lagrange multiplier term equals to zero actually gives you this horrendous looking set of superfield equations, which you now have to solve. And, um, and formidable though they look, it was indeed solved. And all of these unknown superfields, capital A, C, and all of this were actually expressed in terms of a single superfield and its super covariant derivative. And they did a rest frame analysis to show that this indeed contains the correct degrees of freedom. So it's a, it's a formidable achievement. So if it is really a formidable achievement, then what more do we want? Well, first and foremost is that vertex operators are constructed solely because we want to compute scattering amplitudes. And for this purpose, in Pio Spinner at least, one needs to know the full theta expansion of the vertex. This is lacking in Berkowitz Chandya construction. So their risk frame analysis guarantees that this contains the correct degrees of freedom. But in a general frame, uh, apart from the risk frame, one does not know what is the theta expansion of this uh, field BMN. So we actually need a general prescription to repeat this feat. And the, another thing is that, see, they looked at this set of equations and they've somehow managed to write down a solution. It does not really tell us that how to repeat this feat for higher massive states, because these equations are going to keep on getting longer and more complicated looking. So one needs a systematic procedure to construct massive vertices in pure spinner. And this same procedure must also allow ones to perform the full covariant theta expansion so that those vertices can be used to compute amplitudes. And finally, if you can manage to give such a procedure and construct such vertices and their theta expansion, one should be able to compute scattering involving external massive states, compare with RNS and establish the equivalence once and for all. So let us tell that what systematic procedure we proposed. So I'm going to, the way I'm going to do is that I'm going to give you the steps and immediately below, I'm going to give you the examples how this step is realized for the first massive states. So the first step is something that I've already told you that you write down the most general such object for the nth massive state with conformal weight n and post number one operator. So for example, for n equals to one, this is the most general thing that you can write down. So for step two is a very crucial thing is that we say that instead of trying to represent our super multiplied by a single super field, we are actually going to introduce a super field for each physical field that is there in the super multiplet. So let us first focus on this example. So in the first massive states, there are three physical fields, two bosonic and one fermionic. And we are going to say that we are going to introduce a super field for each of them. And they are defined such that their lowest component is precisely that physical field. So right now it might seem like an overkill that to introduce three superfields to describe one super multiplet, but we will see that this actually is what helps us in writing down the solution as well as doing the theta expansion to all orders. So, uh, and of course, uh, all these superfields are not going to be independent. We are going to see that how they are going to be related to each other. And one more thing of the defining characteristics of this physical superfield is that remember this physical fields satisfied some transversality conditions we propose that we promote those transversality conditions and the traceless conditions to the full superfield level. So if, if KM Shy M alpha was zero for small Shy, then for the superfield also, we say that that has to be zero. And similarly for the other, other relations. For step three is essentially to, uh, you know, derive all constraints between operators OI. This constraints can be of two form. One is due to the PO spinner constraints, or it could be because of the fact that these capital pi's and small d's, because they don't satisfy a free field OP, they actually have other operators appearing in the OP uh, on the right hand side. So there could be constraints uh, based on that. So you first derive all such constraints at the uh, conformal weight n and ghost number, uh, whatever is the correct ghost number, which is ghost number two. And for all of this constraint, you can have two options. If you can really solve and eliminate some operators in favor of the others, you can go ahead and do that. 
but because of the sort of convoluted tensor structure more often than not you will find that simply introducing a lagrange multiplier is the easiest thing to do so you can do that as well so once you have done that incorporate this into the brsc condition so for example barkovic sandia already did this they introduced this lagrange multiplier for this and they wrote down an identically zero expression which is to be added to the qe equals to zero equation so this step 4 is a crucial step in our relationship is that we use the representation uh, theory of the little group so9 uh, to write down answers for each superfields each unknown superfields as a linear combination of the physical superfields so physical superfields are the ones that we introduced here this uh, additional things so how does that work so for example we have the superfield a alpha mn which is an unknown superfield which appears in the first massive vertex so we can decompose it in rest frame as the follows it can be either 0a so a is a spatial index so our convention is that if it's the later part of the latin alphabets then these are the full lorentz indices if it is the beginning part of the latin alphabets then it, it's purely spatial indices so if alpha 0a or if alpha ab so if alpha 0a can be decomposed as 16 times 9 as 16 plus 128 so we recognize that 16 is an unphysical uh, irrep for our uh, problem because the first super multiplet first massive multiplet does not have any 16 representation but it does contain 1 128 we do the similar game with if alpha ab which is 16 times 36 it contains 1 128 and a 16 and 432 which are unphysical so we from this analysis we figure out that this if alpha mn must have two independent tensor structures which are linear in the physical superfield corresponding to this representation 128 which is the superfield capital chi m alpha and once this representation theory already tells us that there are two such ways we can realize this linearly in terms of chi just simply by investigation you can write down this tensor structures and put some unknown numerical coefficients in terms of them so these a and b's right now these are some complex numbers so you do the same thing for all unknown superfield you do this group theoretic analysis and you write down an answers with an unknown coefficients for all of them you do the similar thing for a bunch of relationships that we call recurrence relationship which is essentially you take the fermionic superfields and take super covariant derivatives and you try to re-express them in terms of the bosonic physical superfields so let us one second look at the example So if I take the physical superfield GMN and take its super covariant derivative, I can decompose this 16 times 44 as 128 plus 576. It tells us that d alpha GMN must be expressed in terms of a linear combination of 128 only in one way, and one by investigation we can figure out that this is has to be the right combination. And if we put our unknown coefficient a1 like this, so we do similar thing for d alpha chi and d alpha BMNP as well. and this relationship actually will prove to be very very powerful in getting us the full theta expansion covariantly once we have done all of this we are actually in a position to solve the qv equals to zero equation we have to solve that this answers are consistent with the definition of the physical superfields and we also have to ensure that these answers are mutually consistent so what why what do i mean by mutually consistent because remember that if i take two such d alphas these two d alphas or d betas they actually can be represented in terms of momenta so whatever expression i have of d alpha chi should be consistent with this as well so essentially what we have done is that remember one second let me flash the horrible looking equations this superfield equation solving in terms of this unknown superfield we have actually reduced it into solving for some unknown complex number coefficients using this group theory analysis so determining f alpha mn now just boils down to determining this complex number small a and small b from qv equals to 0 and uh, you you can uh, basically do that and uh, the construction uh, for the nth or the first massive states you can recover the barkovic sandia vertex and additionally you can now actually give its full covariant theta expansion now what about the integrated massive vertex so let me quickly give the result so the integrated massive vertex for the first massive state should we should first write down the most general weight 2 and host number 0 operator and you can see that as you go higher and higher in weight the number of terms will keep on increasing more and more and this is where the group theory based analysis will prove to be very powerful because right now you have a bunch of unknown superfields and you may feel overwhelmed but the moment you do the representation theory based ansatz 
you see a bunch of them will be identically zero because they cannot contain the correct physical representation based on the representation theory. And only these have the hope of surviving in the final integrated vertex. And once we have down written down this answers, figuring out this unknown superfields now boils down to figuring out this unknown complex coefficients, this F1, the small a's and so on and so forth. And essentially now what we have to sol solve is instead of like in unintegrated, we solved QV equals to zero. Right now we have to solve QU equals to del V. Once again, you have to take into account all the constraints by either using Lagrange multiplier or by direct elimination. And when you do that, you precisely get, so all these coefficients are numerical coefficients can be determined. And this is the final answer. And this construction is the new construction. The integrated massive vertex was not known before our construction. And it's a vindication that this prescription works. So how do we know that our prescription works? To recap, it reproduces the Barkovitz and the vertex for n equals to one and their rest frame analysis. It's a consistency check. It gives a complete covariant theta expansion of the Barkovitz and the vertex, which is a new result. And of course it's uh, consistent with whatever they have. And it, we could readily extend this uh, prescription to construct the integrated vertex for the first massive states for the first time. And then finally, what we can do now that now that we have the integrated and unintegrated vertex, we are quite free to compute uh, scattering amplitudes involving external massive states and compare them with the RNS computation and see whether the PR spinner and the RNS computation gives the same result for external massive states as well or not. Uh, so how, how am I doing with time? So really you can uh, take like another 15 minutes or so. How much of oh. you need? Oh, I see. I see. That's that's great. That's great. Okay. So since since I since I mentioned this theta expansion, so let me spend uh, a couple of minutes in uh, telling you that how this uh, recurrence relations actually help us a lot, or uh, help us immensely in figuring out the full covariant theta expansion to all orders. So remember, I told you that uh, uh, we have to figure out uh, all the equations like d alpha psi is that psi was a fermionic superfield, so it's covariant derivative, super covariant derivative should be expressed in terms of the bosonic superfield. So all these would have had some unknown coefficients, but after solving, we could fix all the coefficients. So this is the final answer that we have written here. And the point is that I tried, came to, I'm going to make here is that these three relations in tandem are going to give us the full covariant theta expansion. So this is, this is the payoff while working with three superfields for a single supermultiplet instead of a single one. So for, for this also, you should uh, uh, remember this uh, relationship with our convention of uh, super covariant derivative and the normalization of momentum. So these three relationship, we can schematically write like this. So this capital D is this operator and you can roughly think of this capital D operator. What it does is that when it acts on a superfield, extracts out the theta to the power L plus one -th factor of that. So D L plus one extracts out the theta to the power L plus one -th coefficient of this capital Psi. So look at this recurrence relationships and suppose we start at L equals to zero. So at L equals to zero, it extracts out the theta equals to zero part of capital G and capital B. But we already know what is theta equals to zero part of capital G and capital B. That is by definition, the field small g and small b. And this one gives the th first theta expansion of the capital Psi. So theta, theta's coefficient in capital Psi superfield expansion is determined in terms of the theta zeroth coefficients of capital G and capital B. Once we have that and we come here, so suppose put, you put L equals to two here. So the first expansion of capital Psi is now known from the first line. We plug that back here but that determines the second theta expansion of capital B and similarly second expansion of capital G. Once you know the second theta squared expansion of capital B and capital G, you can plug this back here and you can determine this of the next higher order of Xi, Xi and then you can keep on playing this role, recurs you can keep on doing this recursion uh, relationship again and again. And of course, theta being a Grassmann odd variable, it terminates at theta to the power 16 to be exact. So once you have 16 thetas, you cannot have any more theta expansion because we're working on 10 dimensional spinners. And at that point, this recursion relation terminates. And we have, and since our seed relationship only contained the physical fields, small chi, small g, and small b, 
at all order we are guaranteed that this theta expansion contains only the physical field so this is completely on shell superfield there are no auxiliary fields no auxiliary degrees of freedoms are needed so this is this is what uh, actually helps us in uh, doing the theta expansion to all order so this might look a bit uh, cumbersome to do by hand because the tensor structures will go bigger and bigger but this is where uh, the modern technology comes a lot handy uh, you can use mathematica or other computer algebra systems that you like uh, in which you can automatize this procedure and you can actually uh, given a good uh, uh, performance computation system you can actually or even a semi decent uh, computation system you can actually do this quite easily so for example the theta expansion of shy s uh, or sh the superfield shy up to order theta cube looks something like this so this is this is something that you can uh, figure out uh, using mathematica also by hand and then you can sub do a lot of checks and so on and so forth and you need this theta expansion as i will shortly explain to actually compute the amplitudes in uh, uh, in this uh, pure spinner formulation okay so for this talk we are only going to focus on three level amplitudes but i don't want you to uh, surmise from here that pure spinner works only for three level amplitudes pure spinner works for uh, loop level amplitudes as well with some uh, caveat for uh, very high genuses but uh, it, it has been used to compute two loop one loop three loop all kinds of amplitudes so for now let us focus on three level amplitudes so in point amplitude prescription is something that we are all familiar with you fix the you use the sl2r in the disk to fix the location of three of the punctures and you use the three unintegrated vertex operators for those and for the rest you use the integrated vertex so we let us let us focus on three point which is the simplest thing that you can do here some kind of decay process if you like and the, this this typical in point, three point amplitudes or in point amplitudes in pure spinner will actually factorize into two part one part will contain all this plane wave factors so remember all these vertex factors has this plane wave implicit which i was never sort of keeping track but of course when we are computing amplitudes we need to reinsert them because they are very important so this plane wave factors uh, this correlation function is something that we are already familiar from our bosonic strings or rns strings whichever you like the other part is some correlation function in what is called a pure spinner superspace that's what this pss stands for and this pure spinner superspace is uh, normalized as something which is schematically written as lambda cube theta 5 equals to 1 what does this mean it means that this correlation function this pure spinner correlation superspace correlation function at three level will be trivially zero unless it contains precisely three factors of lambda that is gauss number 3 and five factors of theta so th five theta zero modes and three lambda zero modes are needed otherwise this thing will trivially vanish so if you have uh, done bosonic strings or uh, rns strings so this is uh, akin to the condition like c del c del 2c equals to 1 so for our case for three point each unintegrated vertex is already at gauss number 1 so it is guaranteed that v1 v2 v3 will always be of uh, power lambda q so that part is automatic but when we expand this vertex this will have theta expansion to all uh, powers of theta uh, i mean th for, they will have theta independent piece theta linear piece theta to the power uh, theta square square and so on and so forth so from the multiplication we actually need to keep only the terms which uh, contain theta to the power 5 the rest because of this uh, this uh, no zero mode saturation will all be trivially guaranteed to give us zero so essentially it means that we need to theta expand all three vertices and we need to keep only the terms which are theta to the power 5 and when you take into account all such terms and you into multiply with the plane wave answer which you know already from the uh, your usual bosonic string theory course then you can get the full answer so it's really really that simple so how do we show the equivalence to the rns for the external massive states so we have all the ingredients that we need so let us take a specific class of amplitudes so let us take the simplest amplitudes let us take two of the vertex to be massless but let's take the third one to be massive and this three point functions we will take for a fixed order so which is even more restrictive so we are not going to sum over all orders we are going to give a particular order and for a fixed order we are going to compute using both rns as well as pure spinner 
and the relative normalization one can sort of put it into some coefficient g field why is there a relative normalization simply because these are two independent formulation and there is no a priori guarantee that the vertex operator in the rms and the vertex operator in the pure spin while they do describe the same physical fields have the same field renormalization field normalization so there should there can be and there is a relative normalization between the two formulation so let's suppose that relative normalization is g field so we 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 keep the normalization for the pure spinner to be 1 and we dump all the relative normalization in this uh, this uh, rms uh, normalization so it, that that's perfectly fine to do because it's a ratio which is important not the absolute value so with that in mind let us look into all possible amplitudes so first let us look into three massless uh, correlator function this was already computed by bokovitz and mafra uh, but we needed to compute them again because our conventions and uh, some of the uh, some of the numerical factors of uh, which are dependent on conventions were slightly different so we needed to fix our convention with the, num the uh, numerical relative normalization in our convention as well so that's why we first have to consider all three massless so a is gluon the chi stands for gluino small b stands for the small bmnp field small g stands for the small gmn field and small shy stands for this shy m alpha field so first if i look into these three point correlation functions i can fix the relative normalization for the gluons which is ga and once i know ga in the second from using the second dictionary we can fix the relative normalization for the gluino so the first two lines fixes the gluon and the gluino normalization for me and this normalization once again they have already been determined but we just had to rederive them in our convention but these are the new ones these are the ones that has not been com computed in the pure spinner formulation as well and also i should say that of course there is a kinematic structure as well that of course matches for both side we are only comparing the overall normalization otherwise of course this uh, slide would have been completely unnecessary so so this a b kai kai b a g kai kai g all these six uh, three point functions in this fixed ordering is something that is computed new so you can see that we can use this one to fix gb we can use this one to fix gg and if we can use this one to fix g shy but once we have fixed this thing we have actually a very strong consistency check for the massive vertex which is essentially the point that there is another amplitude involving this renormalization gb there is another amplitude involving the normalization gg and there is another amplitude involving the normalization g shy and we don't have any more freedom to play around with this thing anymore because everything is fixed ga is fixed gk is fixed gb is fixed gg is fixed and g shy is fixed with everything fixed if we put this number here the better come out to be exactly 1 over 480 and similarly here and similarly here if they don't then this whole thing is uh, for nothing and something is going wrong but of course when we do that we find that they exactly match and this is a very non trivial consistency check and this is for the first time that uh, anyone has explicitly shown that the pure spinner formulation and rns formulation gives the same result when you consider external massive states for the massless states the such explicit check had been done before for massive states this was the first time such a test was done so yeah i'm i'm basically done at this point so uh, once you fix the num the numbers uh, looks a bit uh, weird with once but once you fix this numbers and with this choice of relative normalization the explicit equivalence between pure spin and rns now has been extended from massless states to include the first massive states as well so what's the, what's the outlook so we have given a very systematic procedure to construct massive vertices and we have explicitly shown that this procedure works for the first massive states we have computed the rederived the unintegrated vertex we have constructed the integrated vertex for the first time and we have explicitly sort of uh, shown the equivalence between the rns and pure spinner with this uh, vertex operators that has been constructed now one question that we can ask is that how do we know that this procedure of this prescription will continue to work at arbitrary mass order so one way to do that is that remember i told you that there is already a ddf like construction due to renan jusinskas but that because it's a ddf like construction it involves representing the superfields in terms of this so8 uh, re representation so it 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 is not poincare covariant anymore 
But if we could map our systematic procedure to that DDF-like construction, then that is kind of uh, a complete a proof that our prescription actually works for all mass massive order. So right now, if you ask me as a physicist, we are absolutely sure that this procedure works for all massive order. We can't see where things might go wrong. Everything works out and the construction of the integrated vertex was a very non-trivial uh, construction. And the fact that this works uh, is, a, is a very strong vindication of this procedure. But if you really say that, is this a proof in the mathematical sense of the word? Well, it's not a proof as of yet. But then we can also ask the question that pure spinner formulation actually, besides uh, enjoying a lot of success in the computing string amplitudes, has also been massively successful on being uh, a, a very strong candidate in quantizing strings in uh, RR flux backgrounds, in uh, specifically in ADS5 times S5 and other interesting backgrounds for very many reasons. So massless vertices actually has been constructed there as well. One can ask that how we can adopt this method to construct massive vertices in ADS backgrounds. Um, there has been a, a flurry of work in last uh, decade in uh, basically writing down the endpoint amplitudes for massless states at higher loop levels as well. And the wall sheet basis integrals has been uh, figured out by a lot of authors and incomplete list is there and here. And they have also recently figured it out for the massive states as well. And one good thing about that is that it's formalism independent. So even for pure spinner, we should be able to connect with the result and see that uh, this whole thing is consistent. A more uh, ambitious question would be to come up with a more regularized big host in pure spinner. This is something that I could not talk about due to lack of time. A better multi-loop amplitude prescriptions and eventually what about uh, off-shell states in pure spinner and uh, so on and so forth. So with these uh, uh, open questions in mind, I uh, thank you for listening and I hope all of you stay safe in these troubled times. Let us thank Subranil for that wonderful talk. If anyone has any questions for the speaker, feel free to ask. Um, so, Subranil, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Um, sorry. So this is somewhat of a, of a slightly big question. So you had these various steps in trying to figure out um, uh, these vertex operators uh, in the massive case. Um, yeah. I was wondering whether um, do you see some kind of a pattern there, uh, which can kind of bootstrap the whole thing into some kind of a string field or something. Um, like, uh, can you formalize this procedure into something that, um, like for example, this thing of uh, introducing so many super fields, can you package them all into some, uh, some single object? Uh, and uh, yeah, um, it, it, it's a kind of vague question. It's a question of whether. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Um, yeah, this is, this is of interest to us as well. Um, so, so I don't have a very concrete answer, but let me let me uh, say something. Um, since the question itself is a bit vague, also let me give uh, a bit of a vague speculations. So, one thing that uh, was pointed out to us by Ashok that uh, this this thing about introducing superfields for uh, each physical state in your multiplet was actually already done for the massless multiplets in supergravity. So, this is what is called this um, rheonomic formulation of supergravity. So, so there actually they have a very nice way of packaging all that in, uh, in terms of what is uh, called free differential algebras. So, so one good thing would be to see that whether uh, the way we have introduced all these massive uh, super fields for each of the uh, physical fields in this massive super multiplet, whether uh, they also have similar nice algebraic structure and uh, pro probably not exactly identical to the, what happens in the rheonomic formulation, but something similar. So that that's definitely is something of an interest. Um, regarding another point that you mentioned that whether one can bootstrap this, actually there is uh, there is a way to bootstrap this um, this whole thing is that if if, if you have uh, if you have constructed the massless uh, vertices which 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 is already known for the integrated as well as the unintegrated, 
then you can actually take OPEs of these uh, two such massless uh, vertices, integrated and unintegrated, and you can actually sort of um, generate uh, using the holomorphic factorization. You can actually generate the higher massive vertices. So that kind of bootstrapping is already there. Uh, what 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 we actually did look into that, but the problem is that that does not seem to be the most convenient way to construct the massive vertices. While it guarantees you that you will be by construction, you will construct the massive vertex, but it's not most convenient for computing amplitudes, say for example. So so the superfills will come in this weird form of some OPs of massless superfills and the superfills and uh, some combination of that. So one one might wonder that whether now that we have actually the answer for the massive integrated and unintegrated, one can compare the answer from the holomorphic factorization and the answer that we have and see whether there is a nice way of uh, repackaging that answer in this. Because if that can be done, then uh, this process can be bootstrapped to any arbitrary mass order. So yeah, th 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 these are just two sort of uh, loose ideas that we have. Sorry, so just a follow up question. This last yeah. thing that you mentioned, is it a bit like the DDF construction or? Uh, uh, no, it's, 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 it's not DDF construction. You don't need to actually express anything in terms of this um, SOH superfields. It's much simpler than that. It's, uh, it's um, so yeah, I, I, if I could write, it would have been best. Uh, I mean, essentially it simply means that um, if you have uh, constructed the massless vertex operators, uh, some V1, so suppose it's V, so you take two such massless uh, vertex operators, V1 and V2, and you take OP of them. And uh, then you can sort of, you know, suitably uh, adjust uh, some of the momentas and you can sort of, uh, so, if, so V1 has a momentum K1 and V2 has a momentum K2. And K1 dot K2, if you just sort of uh, fix it to be the, some massive, the mass of the nth massive state, then you can show that this uh, in actually in some sense gives you the unintegrated vertex for the nth massive state. And uh, the integrated one is basically where you take the OP with the unintegrated massless and the integrated massless. So this sort of game you can uh, play and uh, you can, you can definitely prove that this will give you the unintegrated and the integrated vertex for any arbitrary massive state. The question is that, writing down the explicit expression for those vertices, whether they're the easiest thing to do or not. And it turns out that they are not so easy. So if, if you had asked me to construct the first massive state that way, actually we did try to do that before we came up with this prescription, we did try to do it that way. And it was, it was a very ugly looking, horrendous looking thing. So at that point, we didn't have uh, much insight into that. But now that we do have an answer and we know that the answer is correct, one can try to sort of see, compare the both sides and see whether there is a nicer way of repackaging that ugly looking thing um, such that that process can be um, sort of uh, automatized. Can I just add something? So in the RNS formulation, the DDF construction is, uh, in my understanding, by far the simplest way to construct vertex of arbitrary are the fairly excited vertex operators are also physical. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm slightly surprised. That, so, I mean, so what, I, what I mean is that if you just take the, the standard DDF construction, you can. So, sorry, I'm, I'm, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't hear you that well. Can you just speak a bit louder? Ah. Ah, um, so, what I'm saying is that in the standard RNS formulation, uh -huh. it's actually probably the easiest way, at least that I'm aware of, to construct arbitrarily massive vertex operators that are also physical. So I'm slightly surprised that you're saying that it's harder in the pure spinner formula formulation to use the DDF. And in particular, I would expect that if you take these DDF operators and you compute all of the, well, you, you know a lot of the corresponding vertex operators. So you compute the OPs and the corresponding contour integrals and you write them as local operators, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. you should be able to read off the covariant vertex operators. Okay, so let me let me correct so one thing. By suitably identifying the polarization tensors and the and the momenta mm -hmm. uh, for beyond the SO8. 
just yeah. so 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 yeah i mean so first and foremost i'm not saying that the ddf construction is harder in pure spinner the ddf so you can't exactly have the ddf construction but you have something very similar to that which is called the ddf like construction um and the ddf like construction works uh, fantastically i mean renan in his paper he completely showed that this ddf like construction uh, is works for any arbitrary massive uh, state the point is that in the ddf like construction you have the vertex operators represented in terms of this uh, soh superfields which is uh, which is otherwise okay but the only thing is that you know in pure spinner your biggest selling point was that it's a manifestly super poincare covariant formulation so if you are constructing vertex operators which are in light cone so that's not uh, really a good thing because then somebody will say that why don't we just work with green schwartz for example so that's that's the issue so well, we need a full covariant construction of vertex operator and going from the full covariant construction from the ddf like construction is not the easiest thing to do so what i what i what i mean actually is that uh, after you've carried out the after you write the corresponding ddf vertex operators as local operators Mm -hmm. Then the the light cone nature of the coordinates, uh, you can you can remove it essentially and make it completely covariant. At least in the RNS formulation, it looks like well you start off with light cone coordinates, but you can rewrite the whole thing uh, sort of covariantly just by reading off. But you have to first write it as as a local vertex operators. So you have to do all the normal ordering first, and then it will become manifest. What the corresponding covariant vertex operators are. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure that so in pure spinner covariant polarization tensors. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, please go. So on. what I mean is that, is that you would have some some mm -hmm. you would end up with some uh, polarization tensors and momentum which have indices in all space time directions, and the only thing that the DDF will provide for you is an explicit one explicit representation for these polarization tensors. Which you don't have to use if you want to, to, to rely on the covariant formulation, but it will also provide the relation between the various polarization tensors and the momenta. And if you you can you can then drop the explicit representations of the polarization tensors and the momenta in favor of the actual relations between these quantities. And if you do that, then the corresponding vertex operators will be covariant manifestly, and for arbitrary states, at least this is this is the, what happens in the RNS, as far as I understand. Yeah, I, yeah, the, you're right. That's that's exactly what happens in RNS. But see, one major difference is that in RNS you don't actually work with superfields, so you don't you only need to worry about polarizations and uh, the fact sort of uh, how to sort of covariantize the polarization that you get from the DDF. Uh, but here you actually have a superfield that appears in the vertex. And the SOH superfield, it means that you know that superfield belongs in a superspace, which is uh, the, all, all the thetas and all these x's. These are in this SOH representation. So going to that, going starting from that and going to the superfield for this uh, SO9 comma one, that is not something that is easily done. So it's it's you don't you do, you know you need you need not only just take care of the polarization, but you also need to sort of go from the this uh, super coordinates, this fermionic super coordinates of the SO8 to the fermionic coordinates of this SO9 comma one. So you need to do that as well. So that that okay, is not right. that is not something that you do very easily. So I see, I see, I see. Thanks for the clarification. That's interesting. Yeah, sure, no problem. Are there any more questions? Okay, if not, then let us thank Subranil once again, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Subranil. Yeah. Thank you.